seconds and and uh, wait for the room to fill up. Okay. So I go to Facebook and we wait to Facebook tells me that we're live. Are you going to tell me that you're live yet? I assume we're live. Well, it's telling me that the meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. Yeah, it's just always trying to find it on Facebook. Oh, see. Oh, okay. The little thing will tell me. Ah, there we go. There's the little thing that tells me we're live. And when we turn off past us. Okay, lovely. Yes. So we'll just wait for a little bit, then we'll do some uh, proper introductions um, and wait for the room, as it were, to fill up. And who is here already? There's Sai. Hello, Sai. Um, and Katrina, are you actually going to watch Facebook at the same time? Are you going to multitask? You don't have to. Well, I'm just wondering. I don't know. Maybe not. Oh, no, it's, yeah. oh my gosh, that's quite, that's quite spooky, actually. What, okay. the past you? No, maybe not. Maybe yeah, not. It, that's absolutely fine. So um, what tends to happen is um, Sai um, works with us with the Academy and um, he'll pay attention to the chat box for us. OK. Um, so we'll just wait for a few more seconds. We're filling up quite nicely in the room. Um, and anybody in the uh, chat box is welcome to say hi. And then we'll do some introductions. Otherwise, just have to repeat myself. <laughs> Although I have a new, um, before, while we're waiting, I have a new friend <laughs> who sticks his tongue out when you squeeze. Oh, oh that's fabulous. It was, it's, um, a, a fantastic uh, teenager that I consult with um, and she had one and I was like okay I have to get one of those. Uh, 27 people okay we can do introductions with 27 people that's lovely. Um, so oh Fiona from Dundee hello and uh, Gemma hello um, so lovely. So quick introductions then I am uh, Dr Chloe Farahar of Academy, where Academy is an educative platform where only autistic people or otherwise neurodivergent are allowed to come and educate on a topic uh, so no no non-autistic people allowed in this space um, and today I am joined by Dr Katrina Stewart and I have learnt very recently that I have been saying your name incorrectly throughout the whole time that I've known you. <laughs> That's all right, most people do, don't worry. <laughs> Which was very frustrating. Um, and the only reason I know that is because I have another consultee um, uh, mm. with the name Katrina in Scotland. Yeah. Like mortified that I've known you for, I think, a couple of years and I've been saying your name incorrectly this whole time. Um, so. I really don't worry. I, I, I don't even notice anymore, to be honest, Chloe, because, because so many people just don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, well, but that's very frustrating. I said I changed both my first and my last name um, because my first name was really impossible to pronounce. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, so lovely. So hello, people. We've got twenty-seven people here already. Um, so today, um, Katrina, we've got a pre-recorded uh, short presentation for about twenty-five minutes, and then we are going to be here to take any questions or comments or just have a discussion um, about the actual pre-record. Um, before we jump in with the pre-record, we tend to ask um, new guests to Academy just some quick questions. Um, basically, who are you and what are your specialisations? So what things are you interested in? Okay, I could be really kind of whatever and say, well, I'm still trying to work that one out, Chloe. <laughs> but, That's fine too. <laughs> you know, I mean, after decades and decades of masking and pretending to, you know, do the, do the whole paddling like a swan thing, I'm, I'm, it's still a work in progress. Um, but, right, so I'm Katrina Stewart. Um, I founded Swan, co-founded Swan in 2012, and I, I did it on the back of my PhD research which was focused on girls with Asperger's syndrome and anxiety and I focused on girls because it was really obvious to me that there were autistic women in the world because they were the ones that were writing the lived experience books, the Anne Holiday Willie for example, Claire Sainsbury, um, they were giving presentations, Ross Blackburn and um, Genevieve Edmonds, they were presenting conferences but they weren't in they weren't anywhere, they weren't in the literature, they weren't being researched, they weren't, you know, there was not, no discussion about autistic women. So also I've been a lifelong feminist and also I have two daughters. 
So I focused on girls and on the back of that, I realized there was nothing available for the autistic women who would begin to realize they might be autistic later on in life. So we founded SWAN. And then actually after that, about a year after SWAN started in 2012, I, I, I snuck off for my own diagnosis. Um, and that, it took me another year or so to, to actually disclose because I was a bit worried about the impact on my career. And then at some point, my children told me I really had to because it was really, really important. I went, yeah. And I do try and do what my children tell me to. So um, it's slightly more complicated than that, but that's in summary. Um, Can I just ask, so yeah. when you did your PhD, when did you do your PhD? <clears throat> um, I started it in 2005 and then had to go part time um, and completed it at the end of 2010. So I had my Viva in 2011. Yeah, but that's relatively early in the literature talking about autistic women it was i'm not i'm not being i'm not exaggerating when i started doing my research there was absolutely nothing mm. which made my life easy and it made it difficult um but there was absolutely nothing i think i managed to find one paper which was a uh, n equals one you know it was a case study of one autistic girl um, and that was actually it um, there was nothing else going on and I can tell you absolutely I met Tony Atwood while I was doing my PhD and he went well the interesting thing about your research is you're focused on girls and no one else is so uh, so really I, I know it seems a bit odd but at the point that I completed my PhD there was absolutely nothing else available and Judith Gould and Jack Ashton Smith had just started talking about autistic girls um, and in fact, Judith Gould was fantastic, lovely because I sent, I said, Joe, you might be interested in my research. And she went, yes, come and visit. And I had a whole morning with Judith, Judith to myself down at the Lorna Wing Centre in Bromley. And she was saying, oh, we have to get this published. And she did, she did kind of like encourage me to get it published. So it, and it does seem odd, but that a huge amount has changed in a very short space of time since then. <coughs> Excuse me. And so yeah. Well, that's I say that was that's relatively early work on. I mean, it's not because we've always been here, but the fact that there wasn't anything really being written about autistic women. Um, and then recently um, I did a live with um, uh, Jodie Is it of uh, Autism with Love and the Nurture program and uh, Laura Kirby, where I discussed that we've now seen this explosion almost. It's still not a lot, but we've seen this explosion discussing female <laughs> autism in quotation marks. And the yeah, and the, the discussion that we had in the live was me just explaining that we're already behind now by gendering autism as female autism, as opposed to talking about female autistics and autistic women, non-binary, trans, etc. Um so, fact, sorry. No, go go. No, no, but that's that's a whole that's a whole session in itself. And yeah. um, I was giving a presentation. Um, this week to, to, to another con context and someone in the audience say, well, you know, I don't, I don't identify as, as a female and, you know, if you're focusing on women and you're not kind of, you know, causing, I, I've, and I've had this for years, you know, oh, but you're feeding into the binary thing. Well, actually, <clears throat> I have to say that I do genuinely believe that creating better visibility, greater visibility for autistic females um, is actually making them visible to each other. And that's what SWAN's all about, is actually putting autistic women in touch with each other. We, we you know, we have our peer meet, you know, uh, peer support meetup groups. We have our own online forum. And the fact that we've been able to get in touch with each other, we've been able to start kind of sharing our lived experiences has actually created the environment where we're able to have conversations where people go, but I don't identify with that. I have not met, I've been saying this all week, I have not met a woman and I have met hundreds of women since founding Swan way back in the day. And I'm an autistic woman myself. I was once that 16 year old or that 20 year old and I have, I have daughters. Um, I've not met a single autistic woman who hasn't had some issue around gender identity during their lives. I know certainly when I was young, I didn't want to be a man, but I really, really just believed I'd been wrong, I'd been born in the wrong body, wrong physically, you know, sex body, because I could not make sense of, of what was being asked of me. What, what, I, what I had, and I was talking about this today in an earlier presentation, I had, I had I'm old, and so I was involved in the tail end of second wave feminine, feminism. So what I had was access 
to the feminist movement and I had access to role models who were adult women who were challenging the status quo, who were pushing boundaries in terms of stereotypes, who were doing really interesting things, they were creating art, they were writing, they were, you know, and 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 that was my saving grace. They, I, I genuinely believe that saved my life because I went, oh gosh, that, I could, that's the sort of woman I could be, I could be a feminist. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think, I think it's, um, I think it's really, you know, we need to really kind of understand that if you're talking about uh, focusing on autistic females, you're actually also looking at the ways in which a binary gender society puts additional pressures onto autistic girls. Um, and, and, I think, and hope I'm hopefully I didn't come across as in that work is not of any value because that's not what I mean at all. It's no. yeah, it's the and I'm not talking about the kind of work that you do. And so Annette, who you've obviously met as well, um, her work is um, exploring women, all women, so um, uh, cis and trans and non-binary people's experiences of being autistic yeah. via performance art. Yeah. Um, and so that's a whole different thing. That's looking at the lived experiences of autistic women, all women, non-binary and trans people which is a very different thing to the literature that discusses female autism. I think that's absolutely right. And this is, this is again, something that comes up because I don't, I personally don't believe in a female autism. No. I think there are people who are autistic and what happens is there are different social pressures put on individuals depending on how they're perceived in terms of their gender or their sex. And those, those, those are pressures, they are expectations, sometimes they are also tools for survival. So the tool, tools are different, you know, the strategies are different, the expectations are different. So, um, no, there was something actually I was going to say earlier. I think, I think, um, I just, yes, I know what it is. Just to clarify, I mean, we are a women's group, we are a women's network. And I, like I said, I'm quite an old person. I think I'm, I think I'm also very conscious of that we are very privileged in our culture that we have an opportunity to discuss things like um, gender stereotyping, we have options to kind of say well maybe I'm non-binary or, or that we are actually quite privileged to be able to do that globally speaking most people's lives are absolutely determinedly gendered and sometimes in very brutal ways and as someone who has been a feminist since I was very young I'm, I'm, you know I'm talking over 40 years I, I've swithered over this, but I actually generally, I, I couldn't, I can't, I can't walk away from that, that global population of people who have no choice about whether they decide to call themselves women or not. Um, I, because, because I'm on their side and I've always been on their side. I don't, I hope that makes sense, but I, I just to clarify it, Swan, we are a women's group. Um, but we share, we're about shared lived experience, so we, we include and we welcome anyone with a shared lived experience of being or of being perceived as being female, and that includes um, um, uh, uh, individuals who were assigned female at birth, if that's still the correct term, I hope it is, um, I know it's very fluid and always evolving, um, who, who may identify now as non-binary, but would still like to revisit those experiences. That includes trans women and it also includes trans men, which actually has caused us a little bit of controversy because of course some of the women in the group kind of go, but I don't, I don't want to be around people who actually, you know, are men. Well, anyway, that's, that's our inclusion policy. Um, but, it's that, but that's the thing, and it sounds inclusive anyway. So hopefully um, people are listening even though this isn't actually the topic we were going to talk about, but it's the way the way of the world when it comes to being autistic and having a conversation yep. um, is yeah. I think fundamentally there is a difference between female male autism and female autistics, and those stories need to, to be represented and spoken about. Um, so that's yeah, that's I guess what how I was hoping that I was coming across that that is oh, very absolutely important. Chloe no and it's a really it, the, anyway the really important questions to ask it's an important conversation to have because it's so much a part of our lives the gender identity thing is is a, is a big thing in in our lives as autistic people well I want to have this maybe hopefully final comment because I'm I'm conscious that this isn't what we were going to talk about but um which is fine because it's I love these sorts of conversations anyway um but what i found really um interesting was when we we had um, nick walker on and she was explaining about um you know the term neuroqueer and so for instance i do relatively consider myself to be cis and straight cis straight woman 
that's what I consider myself to be. But because of my neurology, yeah. Nick explained being neuroqueer means I also queer my gender because of my neurology. So because I have that sensory sensitivity to hair, I shave my head because of being autistic. But that also means I'm queering my gender because I'm not performing that female gender stereotype of having long locks, for instance, which I found really interesting. Um, I love the term neuroqueer. I love it um, for, for all sorts of reasons. I, I think that 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 might be slightly debatable. I mean, I don't know about the shaving the hair, but for example, one of the things I found really fascinating when I learned a little bit about the Touaregs, for example, who are nomadic people in the north north of Africa. I don't know if you if you've heard of them. Um, but in their culture, their traditional culture, it's men that cover their faces, not, not Honestly, women. Yes, societally, I don't. Okay. So yeah, again, in you, the UK, yeah. About in your particular, our particular culture, as opposed yes. to, you know. But um, but it, no, it's a it's a really sorry, my computer system a weird thing and flagged something up that I didn't want to. Um, but yeah, it's it's a fascinating topic. But but <laughs> it's a fascinating topic. I could talk about this with you for hours, actually. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, I'm very conscious that um, we will, and um, as much as I would love, absolutely love to as well. Um, okay. So lovely learners, we are um discussing employment. So I'm just about to start sharing, um, and so um, Katrina, you are welcome to um you can turn your camera and mic off for this section if you like have a little wander around if you want and then we're going to come back and have a discussion about the topic um so if anyone's got any questions they are welcome to ask so let's just make sure i make this work okay I'm just waiting to make sure it comes up on the screen. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Katrina Stewart. Um, I'm founder and organisational development lead for SWAN, Scottish Women's Autism Network. And I'm going to be talking to you this evening about the work that we're doing with our Scottish Government funded employment project um, and about creating a more inclusive working environment. So I'm just going to share my screen. And start the presentation. So for the last year um, at SWAN, we have been running what is a, what was originally And what we proposed was that we support autistic employees um, who, who we will, who we access through our network, who are probably already in employment, but possibly struggling with advice, coaching and mentoring. And that we also support the employer to create a more inclusive workplace. Um, the project launched last March. I, I kind of just took someone on because I could see that she was uh, really at risk of losing her job um, and I felt I couldn't wait till I'd recruited staff so I, I took that on and then we got Lynn Reid who's a very experienced um, HR expert and has worked uh, most of her working life in the corporate world. She's got an interest in, and training in psychology and specifically kind of psychometrics in, in, in workplace environments and employment kind of context and then Lindsay so she started with us last June and then Lindsay came on board at the beginning of September she's been working as a CEO of a large charity down in Brighton um, so I just want to do a little bit of context about uh, legalities um, in Scotland the civil and political rights of the population are protected by the Human Rights Act 1998 and, uh, and further provisions in the Scotland Act 1998. These rights come from, how well, they've evolved from the European Convention on Human Rights and they include rights in, relating to employment, housing, health, education, and adequate standards of living. 
More recently, we had the United Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities 2006. And of course, autism is a protected characteristic within that um, categorization, if you like, of persons with disabilities. <clears throat> and the Uni United Nations Convention models autism as a disability in, in a kind of, it's not entirely a social model of disability, but it's also not the medical model of disability that, for example, autism is, is um, you know, categorized under, uh, you know, um, say for within the DSM Diagnostic um, Statistics Manual from the United States, where we're categorized as a mental health disorder within a medical model. So the UN Convention is somewhere in between, and it recognizes the social responsibility for um, inclusion or exclusion of persons with disabilities, but it also kind of states that um, autism is, you know, does does include impairments, uh, lifelong impairments. And then in the UK, we have the Equalities Act 2010. So that's been in place for a bit over 10 years. And a lot of people would say that, you know, the impact of that act has really not, not been as good as it should have been. Um, within, the, within the Equalities Act, autism is a protected characteristic. Um, and... Um, you know, people with protected characteristics are entitled to something called reasonable adjustments. Now, the difficulty with that is who decides, it's interpretation of what is meant by a reasonable adjustment, who decides what is the cost and to who. So we'll talk a wee bit more about that going on. The Swan Employment Project has actually been an extremely interesting and, and quite sort of complex kind of a journey for us really um, because we knew we were doing something quite quite groundbreaking um, and um, in the 12 months since we started we've engaged with 32 women and their employers. Um, these women have worked in a, a very wide range of contexts so supermarkets, cinema, local authority, primary and secondary school and universities, travel industry, prison, occupational health, oh I repeated that sorry first and sec secondary education, hospitals, other agencies, we've also worked with other agencies such as Remploy, um, we've worked with unions, um, we've done work with Equate Scotland, and, and we've worked with, with uh, lawyers as well. And we've delivered advice, coaching, mentoring, in workplace support, for example, grievance processes, back to work processes, etc. Um, for the autistic uh, employees, um, we've delivered employer and team training, and we've been working with individuals to mentor, advise and network within, within the wider workplace context. So some of the women that we're working with, for example, are maybe looking to change jobs or they're trying to get into employment. So adjustments, reasonable adjustments and accommodations for autistic employees, what do these look like? And, and Part of the issue that we have with working with employers is, you know, there is a concern. They don't know what these mean. Are they going to cost them a lot of money? Are they going to cause organisational upheaval? And then the question that we are asked quite a lot is their handbook. Um, and, and the reality, of course, is there isn't really um, a handbook on reasonable adjustments because quite apart from anything else, what works for one autistic person in one employment context will not necessarily be helpful for another autistic person in another employment context but um, we are we are going to put together um, you know a handbook uh, on, the, on the back of our project so because you know obviously even just a ballpark starting point would be be something that people would find useful. Um, so the other, one of the things we've been doing throughout this last year is because this is new work and we know we're kind of, you know, um, breaking new ground, if you like, we've really been very, uh, we've made a priority for actually evaluating the project and for, for really uh, recording every step of the way, you know, what, what, are the, what are we finding out? Are there any surprises? Um, what, what are the barriers to us delivering this work? What are the facilitators? Um, and we've also been identifying themes that are, are arising through the work. Um, and these, these are really common ones. Um, lack of understanding of autism in the workplace. Well, that's absolutely endemic to society generally, isn't it? So um, people don't really know about autism. They may well be an awful lot more aware than they used to be that autism exists, but they don't really understand it. 
poor communications is a big thing. That's what it says in the tin, you know, autism is as much as anything a communication issue, but that communication can be, you know, both two ways, if you like, um, or all which ways. Um, perfectionism, well, to, we, you know, we are quite prone to being quite perfectionist. And that has, that has good and bad aspects to it, I suppose, or positive and negative aspects to it. Absent career support coaching mentoring, Lynn was actually quite shocked to realise that mostly autistic women in the workplace, they, they're just focused on, on coping with the job they've got. They don't tend to really be thinking in terms of career progress or what, what they might want to do next. And that support and that employment mentoring that a lot of people get is, doesn't appear to be there for them. There's a lot of workplace bullying. That's not that's probably a surprise. And then, of course, the, the anxiety, mental health issues arising from, from some of these things. So what are our assets? Well, generally, we, we want to do well. Generally, autistic people are very hardworking. That, that autistic perfectionism that seems to be particularly prevalent in girls and women, it means we will work to a very high standard. We tend to be very loyal if people are nice to us. We tend to be, be very loyal. Um, there's that attention to detail that comes from the, you know, the ability to hyper-focus. Um, and autistic people are often very creative and you know, that left field, field thinking and that logic um, and that kind of making connections means we're often very good at, at problem solving too. Some of the barriers we've identified, employer anxiety or distrust, I think in every, every context, workplace context, and with professionals, offices, whatever, people do, uh, they are anxious if they think they're going to be working with autistic people because they don't actually know what that means because they're not well informed, because they don't understand autism. There is a kind of anxiety around, well, how, how, how do I do this? It is also the case that actually when people know you're autistic, unfortunately, it, 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 often that means that the autistic person isn't really trusted to, to, to know themselves, to know about autism, to know what their needs are. So there can be a little bit of a barrier between actually listening to an autistic employee um, who, who wants to say, no, 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 we need to get this from a medical professional. Well, so um, employer fatigue, I what I've identified is, is something where I think people who are otherwise really well-intentioned and they want to make things better and they want to get things right for their autistic employees, but everything they, they've done, it's not worked because they don't know what they're doing. And after a while, I think there's a kind of fatigue sets in and, and it, you know, it's like, we've tried everything we can think of, it's not working kind of fed up with this, I just quite want the problem to go away. And of course the problem going away means that employee going away. So, you know, it's not positive. Management structures can be quite unhelpful if they're not clear, if they don't make sense, um, if they're not enabling of, you know, autistic um, thinking styles, communication. Um, and flexibility and rigid thinking, <laughs> this quite amused me, but on the part of the employer and the management, because autistic people are supposed to be the ones that are, inflexible and are rigid in their thinking but actually I think that's just true of people people get to set ways of doing things and for example if a line manager has a particular style of man line managing and then and then that doesn't work with an employee they quite often don't have a plan b because it's like well it works with everyone else why is it not working with this person um so um you can have a great organizational policy big organization big company big institution you, you can have genuinely a really good sounding organizational policy, but if the support isn't in place for the department, departmental heads, the line managers to implement that those policies, then you're still not going to have inclusive working practices on, on the floor, as it were. And then comes of all these, well, we're starting with recruitment, the recruitment processes often prevent employment of a diverse workforce. Non-inclusive working practices drive the new neurodivergent employees out. Um, employee self-criticism, um, needing self-esteem, bewilderment, you know, exhaustion, ill health, burnout, damaged mental health, sensory and cognitive overload. I mean, some of these environments are so sensory overwhelming that actually if there were some of those sensory um, issues were fixed, it would be good for everyone. Um, so 
You've got employment members of staff who are unable to meet their full potential in the workplace and, and in their lives and, and the potential for lost talent to the organisation. <clears throat> so what are the solutions we're suggesting? We are offering career coaching, career mentoring. We offer our peer support. We offer autism training. So as we know, quite often people get a diagnosis or they self-identify, but actually the available information on autism, apart from places like Academy, um, of course, um, is, is really not helpful. It could be worse than unhelpful. So we offer autistic lived experience um, autism training to, to autistic women. Trying to develop a bit of self-awareness, develop self-assurance, and give and give give them tools, share you know tools for self-care. Um, we also seek to help employers understand that reasonable adjustments and accommodations are not necessarily necessarily that difficult. They're not necessarily particularly resource heavy. They they do need goodwill. They do need a bit of flexibility. They do need creative thinking on the part of the employer. It will bring dividends to them and their company or organisation. The evidence all points to the fact that organisations that have a diverse workforce um, have better outcomes, better um, outputs, better outcomes, happier workforce. Um, and um, so, they, so they will benefit if they can make their, their workplace an inclusive workplace. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just talk a wee bit about um, peer support and mentoring. So obviously the women that get, have been involved in our employment project, which I should say we've, we've had a six month extension to that. So we've got another six months to go. We've got, got, uh, got more funding from Scottish Government to, to continue with the project. Um, and we're just with the management team with Lynn and Lindsay, we're, we're just looking at exactly how we're going to um, use that, that extra six months um, and what we're going to do with it. And one of the things we're doing before I move on um, is we, so last year um, when COVID started, um, we got some emergency funding from Scottish Government from the um, Community Wellbeing Fund. And with that funding, I started running weekly webinars, mental health and wellbeing webinars, which then went down to every fortnight in August. And I also put, uh, commissioned some one-to-one -one, um, counselling service being delivered by autistic professional counsellors, which, uh, which is also still ongoing. Um, but what we've done since um, December is Lynn and Lindsay and myself put together a programme of webinars, um, which run every fortnight. And we're using the themes that have arisen out of the employment project so that every second webinar that we present is based on an employment focused theme. So, for example, a few weeks ago, we ran an, a session on um, influencing skills. Um, we were also testing out the themes and seeing what kind of um, response we get, whether women would like, like more, because actually Lynn was saying that Normally, in, in a corporate context, she would be delivering a, maybe a four or five day program, of, you know, on, on influencing skills. It's not a one and a half hour course. Um, so because we've got such a positive response to that, we've agreed that we will put that on. For, you know, we'll design a four or five module, a, a sort of, you know, active uh, learning sets, uh, Lynn calls them. Um, so we're going to be doing that in the future with that and, and whatever other topics come up that people seem to feel, you know, they'd really, really like. Um, so, um, yeah, so watch watch the space. They're running at the moment, um, I could say, every fortnight. And, and every other every every other second webinar is, is based on a, a general mental health and well-being theme because, after all, we can't actually... Pull, pull those apart they're all very inter interwoven so the women that come to our employment project obviously if they haven't already done if they've not come through the existing you know through the network and they're not already involved with, with our, one of you know one of our meetup groups or our online forum then they, ha they, they have that to access our online forum and the peer support um, and that's one of the things that we've done since 2012, Swan, is we've offered, we offer peer support as in our meetups. And there's a huge power 
to autistic women or autistic girls getting together with others and the impact that has on um, how, how, they, how, how they view themselves. Um, but we wanted to try and find a way of evidencing this. And we, we got funding from Scottish Government um, to run a one year pilot, um, a peer mentoring project, which we called Under Our Wing. <clears throat> which is a response to the glaring gaps we identified in education and pastoral care of young autistic women, having a lifelong impact on individuals as they have to navigate their way into adulthood in a world that doesn't understand or accommodate them, often hampered by poor mental health, a poor sense of identity, and without the necessary tools for positive self-care. So we're trying to do something about that. And the programme, um, again, it was, a, it, was, it was a groundbreaking thing, really, because we had, we had to, we made it up from scratch. Um, designing it um, you know from the, the, the actual concept to the to the ethical underpinning of what we were trying to do to the practical aspect of delivering this program how do we you know building a pathway for participation we employed an autistic coordinator Ronnie casement who used to be one of our volunteer facilitators and she and I uh, worked together on, on all this, but I have to say she did she did the bulk of the, the, the heavy lifting on the processes and protocols, the risk assessments, the safeguarding. Um, and um, then we put together a programme and then we worked out how we were going to deliver it all. It was very much modelled as a co-production. So we, we encouraged and, and asked for feedback all the way through the project. Um, with, with the participants and we responded to that feedback and kind of slightly re, re, remodeled the, the program to, to respond. Um, Dinah, who delivered the formal mentoring training and I co-mentored each other because I'm not, you know, she's very skilled at what she does. She's, she's worked with getting groups of women into the economy for decades and she works all over the world and she doesn't know so much about autism. So we, we shared, shared a lot of this information with each other, supported each other through, through the program. Um, Ronnie and I delivered aut autism training to the to the participants because, you know, again, as I was saying earlier, we know that the quality of information available to autistic uh, adults is is not is not great. Although it is it is getting better. Um, and Scottish Forestry donated a whole series of of sessions outdoors, doing bushcraft activities, personal development stuff. Um, which was lovely, and though we interspersed those sessions with the more formal kind of, um, you know, teaching PowerPoint type type sessions. The key outcomes we identified were uh, building of identity, confidence, capacity, skills, and citizenship, and these were key outcomes that we identified through talking to the women. Oh, a little bit of demographics very broad age range, um, very broad to, in terms of employment status. We had a number of school aged girls, some of whom were not in schools, a couple were. Range of sexuality and gender identification, including transgender and non-binary. Um, the only real caveat was that people basically had to access our sessions in the central belt. Um, we didn't pay mentors and mentees, we paid their expenses and we paid for their lunches. And we had the programme externally evaluated and participants reported a greater sense of identity, improved self-confidence, uh, having, you know, uh, developed skills and, and made friends, which was great. So here's some photographs um, from our sessions. So the, that photograph down in the middle at the bottom, that's actually an extra session Ronnie and I put on in response to what we got from the mentors about how they really wanted more time with just an autistic led, you know, just an autistic led session. So we we organized a, a session for a day for them um, and we ran a conundrum circle. Um, and uh, and then Ronnie did this thing with the wool where you, where you, I can't remember what she called it, but you kind of, um, you express something about how you feel about what you're doing. And then you, you throw the ball to, to a random other person around the circle. So you kind of make this kind of lovely rainbow colored web. Um, but it was a really good day actually. And we really um, walked through all the individual trainee mentors kind of anxieties because they'd just been paired with their mentee. And so they all had very specific concerns about 
about that relationship or about you know going forward so that we had a really good day kind of working through a lot of that and then the other three photographs are from an away day that that, that Craig from um Scottish Forestry from uh, play, Playing Outdoors, Operation Play Outdoors is his own organisation. He put this away day on for us just towards the end of the programme. We had this fabulous day out in Aberfoyle. <clears throat> um, we also, as part of the programme, we had uh, an art day um, at Project Ability, which is a, an, a disability arts project in Glasgow. Um, and that was really, <laughs> it was really good fun. And we, we designed and, and printed bags all of us so that was that was very good fun and that's a photograph from our from our uh play our away day um which was just it was such a lovely day and our day was described by one of our group as magical mentoring it's really really, really lovely so um this is just a thanks really to the employment project management team um our funders all the women have put Put your face in this and all the women have kept swan swimming along because swan is primarily voluntary volunteer led and it's primarily been been kept going by volunteer autistic women and our allies um so um but uh, yeah it's 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 um it is a product of a lot of different people's commitment and input so thank you very much for listening and stop sharing no Katrina, are you back? Lovely. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, I had one comment um, that I was while well, I was listening, um, but I'm going to grab one that I saw in the comment section. And I've also asked if people have got any comments or questions, if they could post them and then I'll read them out for you. So don't have, you don't have to worry about Facebook. Um, apart from my tech issues. <laughs> at the beginning of trying to share it um so somebody's comment um so it's more a comment than a question so their 21 year old son was coached by an autistic adult advocate mm. when he went for a job interview at a retailer specializing in his specialization made all the difference in the world um, and i know this person so i know they're in scotland so i don't know if that was uh, anything related um, but made all the difference in the world um, he beat off 240 people and got one of two seasonal jobs turns out his female line manager was autistic but had never been open about her autistic identity until her son started working there um, so she said she felt safe to do so and he was so embracing of his autistic adhd identity brilliant Brilliant. And it, it does, it makes such a difference. Um, people who actually understand from the from the inside out. Um, ha, it, we're in an it, interesting situation. Lynn is not identified as autistic. She has a, a young adult son who is, and she's passionate about about what she does. And I have to say, she has coached me through uh, through a few things where my interactions with, you know, in a particular context have, have, have been difficult. And she's coached me in, in ways of kind of slightly turning that around. And it's actually transformational. If you get that kind of support, it can really totally make such huge difference to the outcomes. And um, it, is, it is really difficult because things like interviews and, and I've basically just trying to get to a point where I, I never have to do an interview <laughs> because I'll just make my own positions because I I just don't interview well. Um, and I think that's, there's a really interesting piece of research done. Oh, I wish I could remember her name. I will hunt it out, but she was an Australian woman who did a, did a, a, a small qualitative study on um, she was actually asking women, autistic adult women, um, how they defined their, you know, what they defined as success. And one of the sort of sub questions to that was, um, you know, what had led them to um, taking the path that they'd taken. So in other, in other words, quite a few of them were saying, well, they'd actually ended up doing something different because they'd got a diagnosis of autism as an adult. So they then that had changed their lives and it's changed the routes they'd taken in terms of their 
their employment and she what she picked up on it was a small study but what she picked up on was that actually quite a high proportion of them had created their own routes to employment or they worked in academia which is actually despite the fact that you have to that you lecture it's actually quite a solitary um but you know job it's you spend a lot of time on your own so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so There's well, even because I didn't know I was autistic until I was 32, so I was already, where was I, just about to start my PhD, so I'd already done my undergrad and my master's not knowing I was autistic, but I knew I was different, um, and yeah, I'd forged my own plan of, of how to do things, and, and basically I haven't really had a proper interview since maybe my 20s, um, but yeah, when I've had to interview, when I had to interview for my uh, PhD scholarship, I didn't get the scholarship. I had to get a different scholarship, um, which was a better one. But I just, and and given that we've seen now that we've got we've got research that's demonstrating, um, you know, first impressions by non-autistic people of autistic people when they don't know that they're autistic mm. are not favourable. No. And so there's something qualitatively different to our communication that is just picked up on. And and because so many, so many because often we're really able and um we can present ourselves quite well in paper or in written form. And mm -hmm. um, certainly when I was in my 20s, I, I always got the interview and I rarely got the job. Yeah. <laughs> because I would just go into the interview and I would see people's faces go quite they'd go quite bewildered and you know, I think I think the thing that changed for me was actually working out that mostly there were jobs I didn't want anyway. And and at some point I learned that actually enthusiasm can take you a long way. So if you just go, I really want to do this job. I know I can do it. I really want to do it. I think you're a fabulous organization. That that can be quite helpful. I've tried that. I think it just comes off as insincere. Oh, okay. Okay. Unfortunately. Well, you need to come to you need to come to one of our tra training sessions with Lynn. Um, but she um I wonder if I should admit this here. I recently actually got up, had to do, to, for the first time in a long time, I had to do uh, an interview. Um, and it was a really, really scary interview. And, and Lynn did, did help coach me through it. And I, I'm not saying I wouldn't have got, got the post anyway, because I might well have done, because I've worked with some of the people involved already. So they had an understanding of what I could do. But it certainly made the whole process so much easier for me, because I actually felt really well prepared. Um, so yeah, having having someone who really understands you and you know the co context to give you that coaching and that support is just so invaluable. I'm really chuffed to hear about that though that that's happened in, in Scotland, um, and it's something. So actually, one of the things I do want to say about that is it it can be quite interesting if for us autistic people. We go, but I can't do that. That's I'm I you know, and if you spent a lifetime masking and performing and trying to fit in and then you're actually trying to unpick all of that and step out of that and go no no but I'm autistic and I I need to you know you know work to my who I actually am and my strengths and all this but it's actually quite it can be quite difficult to have someone go well I'm going to actually teach you things like influencing skills and you go well hang on a minute but I, I, I don't want to do this anymore <laughs> yeah but but actually one of the things i've i've learned over over a lifetime is it is possible to learn new skills and it's not necessary it's not everyone learned do you know one of the things that actually really struck me was when lynn, lynn was saying the whole point about influencing skills is it's really a very sophisticated thing that has been developed by non-autistic people because most non-autistic people don't understand about how to communicate in a way that leads to really positive outcomes. So actually, if you understand that what you're getting access to is something that is being developed by non-autistic people because they're just as crap at it as we are, it actually puts the whole thing in different perspective because what you're doing is you're just learning new skills that might actually help you achieve what you want to achieve. And that to me is quite revolutionary. Um, and she's certainly, I mean, Lynn, Lynn has made a huge difference to, to, to me over the last few months. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not for everyone. Not, not everyone wants to go and work for, for an organization. Frankly, I've spent most of my life avoiding it for, 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 you know, for all sorts of reasons.
and this is the thing is I don't and that's the thing I wouldn't want the job based on my ability to um because uh, sadly you know interviews are based on social etiquette or you know when how well they like you as a person and things like this and I do not come across well to neurotypical people when they first meet me um and it's quite uh, it's just and, and I think part of that then will be the fear of knowing that going in kind of makes it worse as well so um, that's really interesting as well because that's that's learned that's kind of learned kind of um almost you know self-identity based on, on on previous experiences um I, I I've met so many autistic people who say oh I really piss people off I want they go well, I think you're fabulous or I think you're really funny or I think you're lovely and they go yeah well okay go figure but um Mm. But that's why I'm trying to build an autistic organisation so that that doesn't, you know, I I don't need necessarily to interview people. I just need to know whether those people can do the work that needs doing. Um, for me, that's much more important. And then hopefully the, the fact that we're autistic will hopefully have some shared commonality. Um, I think the difficulty there as well is it's it's not just my perception it is the fact that over the years prior to knowing I was autistic, I was described in certain ways as unapproachable, standoffish and cold. And so it's not, and I think that's quite frustrating when you think I'm going to go into an interview and I have to be well, not that, coming across that way. <laughs> that, that, but that goes back to that sense of self-esteem and identity and, you know, feeling that you're constantly having to be something that you're not in order to be acceptable. And that's what we have to really really break down um but it, you know it's, it's not it's not about masking it's not about it, it just really is about um learning ways to be able to communicate what you what you need to communicate um i think this is the thing about recruitment practices though i mean that's one of the reasons why it was in that kind of presentation it's like top, top of the list of barriers is actually the recruitment processes themselves can be incredibly um they just put up these big barriers so actually um <laughs> we we as part of the employment project we we we've actually come across a couple of people who who were applying to work with a big national autism charity um so that, so the recommendation was to um ask for the questions beforehand and 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 that particular person got told no, they would get the question 15 minutes before the interview, you know, and I was like, I was going, no, that's, that's worse. That is so yeah. much worse because that they're worse. sitting there outside the interview room going, oh my God, I don't know what to say to that. And the, you know, anxiety, the panic, you know, the kind of adrenaline. Wow. The, I mean, that is actually worse than nothing. That is awful. And that's a big national autism charity. And I don't um, find, I don't see why that's necessary. I why? Don't, I, I don't, yeah what's wrong with preparing your answers so that they're thought through and thorough and it's it is not going to be that way in autopia um, right we've got lots of comments and questions okay, but can i just very quickly just say when we when we advertised for the employment project post um lynn actually came in pro bono and helped me write out the job description then she said oh by the way i really want this job i'm going to apply for it so she came, so she came in as a consultant and then and then we we had 119 applicants and then we interviewed some people, we short lessons, we interviewed some people, and then and then we chose Lindsay. But I made the criteria, you know, I made it so, I just said, you know, we'll make it as inclusive as possible. All we want you to do is talk about why you want the job, what makes you think that you actually, are, you know, what you can bring to the role. There's, there's no trick questions. That is absolutely it. And we'll make it as comfortable with you as possible. And one of the things I was really chuffed about was afterwards, Lindsay said that, um, as, as interviews went, it was probably like the first time she'd been in an interview where she actually really enjoyed the chat. And that's what it felt like. It just felt like and you were- And that's what it should feel like. like, you know, at the end of the day, you're also wanting to work there, not just that they're trying to pick the best candidate, candidate kind of thing. It's, I want to know, who am I going to be working with? Exactly. Um, am I going to be jumping through hoops just to get this job, you know? Um, so there was a comment and, and it was part of, I guess, what I commented is, as well, which which I'm glad because you said that you're not, it's not about trying to teach masking because the comment was that they're worried about that training people to do interviews 
by training them to mask. No, no. And that concern. Well, uh, I think just um, one, some of the things, part of what's come out of our employment project, of course, is that sometimes the outcome is not about keeping people in that job or, or whatever. Sometimes it's about helping them decide that actually that's not, maybe not the job for them. And, and that has to be, we need to be able to say to the funders, actually that is as good an outcome as the alternative. Yes, of course, we're trying to keep them in their jobs, but actually maybe it isn't the right job for them. Maybe that employer is never going to be able to um, get, give them what they need, or maybe they have just gone into the wrong job. And, you know, so, so there's quite a lot of work going on to help redirect people as well, or to help them make, make choices about, well, maybe I don't want to be doing that. Maybe what I really want to do is, is, is that. Um, no, it's not about, I, I can't actually, it's really hard to explain. I think it's, it really is about um, just learning those strategies that allow you to express yourself in the way that you want to express yourself. Because as we all know, it can be really hard for us to do that when we're in a stressful situation or uh, you know any kind of situation where we kind of you know are having to deal with other people it can actually be really hard to be comfortable enough to be your, you know really express what you want to express. And but it's particularly difficult because you're expected to sell yourself. And a lot of us are not good at that. I do not like yeah. picking myself up. No. I'd rather, can I just give you the piece of paper and you see the things I've done? Why do I have to? It's very awkward for some of us. Okay, because yeah. there's quite a few questions. Oh, okay, there. okay. Um, no, no, it's no, not at all, but um, it's lovely that people are interacting. Yeah. So I'm not going to take any more questions now because there are a few, I think, by the time we get through them. Um, okay. So I guess on the back of what we just spoke about, mm -hmm. which is, the peer mentoring is great. So like you say, building people's confidence to go into those situations. Um, but I do wonder how much are employers taking up, for instance, neurodivergent inclusive training? Mm. It seems very heartbreaking that we're working on the autistic person being able to get that employment. I agree um, with you. I, I actually do utterly. So that so ours is a kind of two pronged approach, if if you like. It's not it's not about just focusing on the autistic people. It really isn't. It is very much about trying to work with the employer. Um, I think the reality is it can, it can be really challenging because they for all the reasons that I outlined in that presentation. You know, they might already have tried and felt that you know it was too much effort or actually the distrust of autistic people is the is one that we are really trying to tackle because we've had a number of situations we've had some great uptake and we've had some real interest from other organizations like Remploy heard that our training was really you know they heard about our training for a big big institution and they asked if we would do some training for their um staff so they so Remploy work with people in the workplace with mental health issues to support, support and mentor them in, in the workplace and or you know with their mentor mental health problems. So they were really interested in our training. We did training with their staff. Um, and it, it created about you know it, um, it, um, getting women into STEM uh, uh, jobs and um, we've done some work with them, we've done some training with them, we've done done some some other stuff with them. Um, but what we <laughs> What we have sometimes found is where there's been a relationship built up with an employer, uh, supporting an employee and then working with the employer and the employer's done a access to work kind of assessment. They've gone, yeah, well, we need workplace training. We'd better go to, you know, the National Autistic Society or, or whatever. And, and our, you know, and our staff are going, no, 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 we're actually getting funded by Scottish government to do that training. We can do the training. If you want to pay us lots of money, that's fine. But but there is a, you know, there's a sense that there's a barrier that goes up, so, but you're autistic. No, no, we need to go to the experts. <laughs> so, so we're working out ways to get past that distrust of autistic people as experts, you know. Um, so that, that's a slight challenge, but we're working on it. Yeah, and that's, that's quite a worrying thing, but like I say, working on it. Um, and I, I think it really depends on what field where you are what what you're doing because like you say academia can be it can be quite challenging as an autistic person or a neurodivergent person with with different um challenges in different places like different contexts um but i feel that it also gives me much more freedom 
and people are more interested now because I'm quite openly autistic if people don't know I'm autistic then they must be living under a rock um kind of thing and so I get asked then to do you know talks and things and I, I, I've gone on a weird train of thought in my head because I'm going back to um um uh, the person who was talk, talking about their son being openly autistic and it bringing you know un making that person disclose in the workplace yeah. um because that is one of the big things of the big barriers is that people are like you say because of that well if people are untrusting of autistic people then it makes it very really, very difficult for them to be openly autistic as well i think that's all another aspect another interesting aspect if you get into a workplace and you deliver some training um it's then making sure that employers understand that actually they're then going to have to decide how they're going to respond when some of their other employees go, oh, wow, I'm autistic too. Now, one of the trainings we did, um, with quite a big organisation, it was really interesting because our the woman we were supporting and working with and responding to, to the situation she was in was not openly disclosed at work and she actually was quite scared to disclose at work. I mean, some some people knew her line manager knew, HR knew, for example. Um, and and it was really, it was actually quite sad. I I felt really sad when we did the training because she actually went out of her way to distance herself from that, you know. And two of her colleagues just popped up and went, "Well, I'm pretty sure I'm autistic." Oh, that's really interesting. That just confirms me. I yeah, I'm no not you know. And and so that was really interesting. And actually, hopefully, that would be a really positive outcome from 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 doing the work. Is that it means that some of these some of the colleagues, some of the other autistic, you know, some of the other employees can go, "Well, I'm autistic too." It it is the thing. If you, I mean, a few years ago, I did a consultation for NAS. Um, I did a consultation for um, the Newcastle libraries. They were wanting to someone to do a kind of environmental audit for them. And, and, and I was there for two days and it was really interesting, ran a consultation, went and, 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 you know, and I did say to them, but you know, it's brilliant you're doing this, but you do need to think about if you make autism kind of part of the organizational just narrative and you normalize it and you put things in place to make it more welcoming for autistic people, you're going to have some of your staff going, do you know what, I'm autistic. Because you're talking about libraries, for goodness sake, you know, how many librarians are on, this, on the spectrum? Um, so, yeah, it's, um, yeah. Okay, right, let's look at the questions, because there's loads. Okay. Um, uh, how do you manage conflict between autistic individuals in the network? I facilitate an autistic adult peer support group in Lincolnshire. Oh. Have you got a week? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, just staying really steady. You know, you you can't take responsibility for how other people behave. Um, but uh, this is going to sound a bit naff, possibly, but you can kind of set by you know set an example, and that that means staying calm, not rising to the whatevers. Um, Get yourself a really good sounding board. You know, the early years of Swan, my co-founder, Lynn Moffat, oh, the number of phone calls she fielded for me where I would just go, rah, but because I was doing rah at her, I wasn't doing rah at the people who were just making me go, oh my God. No, it's, it's a challenge. It is a challenge. We're autistic and we're um, reactive and we're often very wounded and um, we were often traumatized and you know we have very fast arousal rates so if people piss us off we just woof um yeah all those things just try to maintain a really calm atmosphere keep the language down try not to react try and just you know get, calm it down um, and I, I know that's a bit vague well, I think that's something because I we've talked about this before. Um, when I say we, sorry, I mean um, people who've tried to support me in the background with Academy or other advocates who you know come on. In that, not allowing ourselves to become islands is really important. So just like you said, reaching out to another person. Oh yes. And saying, I'm really struggling with this. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm having this difficulty with these people, or this group, or something like that. So that you're not doing it by yourself because. I think I, I know the person who, who made that comment and yeah. 
I think what happens a lot of the time is if we're people like ourselves who make those peer groups yep. or support programs or what have you, it means we can't use them. So uh, some a couple few years ago, we in fact there's a few of us have talked about this about the idea of setting up a support network for for people like us, you know, people who are running groups. And but again, we how, have an outline. We can talk about this another time. Okay, you. um, good. Um, I think um, yeah, no, it's come up a number of times. And I remember doing a presentation at a conference once and this really lovely woman came up to the microphone and she said, I just want to ask something, who supports you? And I just, I just you know, I nearly kind of leapt in her. And gave, you know, I was like, oh my God. Um, but this, yeah, it, it is, it's about finding that network. It's about finding that support network and, and just, but in life, you know, before, before the autism, my autism life, if you like, I still had to learn somewhere along the line that when other people are behaving in, in ways that you can go, oh, um, you just have to stay true to what you think is okay. So just stick to your own integrity. And that will that will that will spill out into how you interact with the people that are kind of at war with each other or whatever, or or it won't, and you'll just need end up leaving them to it if that's your decision. But I mean, I yeah, I still feel a lot of sh sh shizzle sometimes, and I just think, oh. Um, but yeah, you just. Well, I mean, like you say, because yes, there's some of us that might be like say the. How did you word it? Arousal, like the the we're quick. Okay. Hi, yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas I'm that person that will just shut down and process and write uh, what I'm thinking. Um, bef you know, so there's and th and then that still means that you're not really dealing necessarily with the person or the situation, um, and but it might be later, for instance. But I definitely and this is a, this is a thing. I think there does need to be a network for autistic advocates, autistic yeah. educators, because, like I say, you know, Annette and I, when we met, we met as members of a peer support pro uh, peer support group. Then we ended up running. The peer support group which means you no longer have that plat you know that space Absolutely. yeah and it's not appropriate for us to we can't go into that space and use it in the same way yeah, so you still, definitely need that, you still need that peer support um i i also have a i'm also quite involved in, in a sort of philosophical or, or, or an organization of practical philosophy and i i do have i do have some I do have a, hmm, I have a basic philosophy um, and that does underpin Swan and it's, it, it is about accepting people where they are, you know, and being as broadly inclusive as you can possibly be. And that, that also, it means the people that piss you off yeah. um, and understanding that, you know, they may be behaving like complete two rags, but they're also autistic and they also have their battles. So it's not always possible. It really absolutely isn't. Sometimes you have to just go right enough already, um, or you have to intervene and go right. Well, we do we do sometimes have to intervene on Swan, for example, if people are beginning to kick off. It doesn't happen very often. Um, but in terms of your own self, whatever, it's just going, okay, I'm here to do a job. They are behaving in, in ways that are not helpful, but they're autistic, they're struggling, whatever, and and and, and just you know, but but Chloe, you're absolutely right. You know, people, those of us who are autistic, who are working with people in this kind of facilitating, educational, peer support, whatever, advocacy, we, we need support too. We definitely do. Yeah. Uh, the next one was um, Katrina. When we will? When we will? Blah, 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 when will we have an autistic workers union? Oh. Well, no, there you go. What an interesting idea. Are you, when are you going to set it up? <laughs> it wasn't my question. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, so I'm saying that to the person who asked the question. When are you going to set it up? <laughs> okay, there you go. That person <laughs> that asked that question. Um, so no, I'm, actually, do you know, that absolutely resonates with something I've been going on about for a while, about we, we, we need to unionise. As a, as a, we do, we do. Have anyway. you talked to Jan Janine Booth? Not recently, no, no, I don't know. But I'm just wondering, that person, maybe maybe reaching out to Janine. Yeah, oh, good idea, yeah. yeah. Um, what jobs can people with auto autism, um, autistic people, 
Um, what jobs can autistic people not do? Do you have to declare this in an interview process? So I think what they're asking is there a legal reason to discriminate an autistic person from working in a position of some description? Well, there's something about the military, isn't there, about that's, that's you know, they, they have that as a kind of ex exclusion, I, which I find utterly bewildering because it's been well known for a very long time, way back in the day, that actually there's a high proportion of autistic people in the armed forces because it's Yeah, my, I mean, my gramps was, un, well, I didn't even get my diagnosis until he'd passed away, but we're pretty sure he was autistic. Yeah. Um, he was in the Navy for years. It's a very... It's role bound. Yeah, it's, it's structured. structured. Yeah. Um, it's... And actually, way back, there was a piece of research that I came across, which which showed that um, it wasn't the military, but engineers figured like eight times more prevalent than any other profession as fathers of autistic children. But there's a lot of engineers in the in the in the military. Um, it was a ship, right? So they built the ship. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yep. Um, and police force, um, you know, so um, I'm not, a, I think the military does say that also might be, an, might be, you know, an excuse to, 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 to be, you know, to be excluded, but I, I, you know, I don't know actually is the answer to your question. I don't actually know. I'm not yeah. an expert in that area. I've not heard of anything in the UK anyway that would actively discriminate in in that way um and I guess their question was do you have to declare that in an interview process um no you don't have to you don't have to declare it in an interview process what you do need to consider though is if you don't and you do need reasonable adjustments and you do need some accommodations that they might well have a good reason to turn around and say, well, why didn't you tell us this at your interview? So, it, you know, you, you have to weigh up the pros and cons of disclosing or not disclosing. We're actually going to be running a session, specifically one of our Swan Different Minds webinars is actually specifically about disclosure. Um, and I- The workplace I, specifically? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, have, is there, is there anybody allowed to attend that, or shall I not link the webinar? No, I'll send you the link because actually, it, it's funded. <laughs> the webinars are funded by Scottish uh, Scottish government. So, um, but you know, it's a webinar, and so I've been publicising them more widely because it's like, well, why why not? And we actually have had people coming through the Spectrum Women Forum. So of course that's international. So we've had people coming from Canada and America. And that's actually really, especially in terms of talking about some of the employment context and some of the COVID stuff, it's actually quite interesting to have people from say the United States, but also working in retail, for example, talking to our retail staff who are going, ah, and sharing that, you know, sharing their, their experiences. So what I'm saying to people is, you know, I'm not xenophobic. Swan is very inclusive. I'm not going to say yes, but no one's going to turf you out. You know I mean? Okay, so hopefully we might might be able to link that. Um, and so I was making a point that, um, yes, we recently did, and I can't think who they are, the, the naval commander that came out as autistic very recently. Oh, you weren't aware of that. Okay. I can't remember who it was. I remember um, one of my students telling us and I had seen um, uh, a news article about it. So if you've got the link, could you pop it in the comment section if you get a chance? And um, right at the beginning of COVID, I was invited to join an independent advisory group to the Scottish Police Authority. And I, I, I ran a survey of autistic people's experiences of the COVID legislation. And as a consequence, this chat got in touch with me, Andy Buchan. I don't know if any of you know him. He used to work for the police and he's written this book and he's done quite a lot of training for the police force, but he's autistic. And we got in touch and we actually had a Zoom chat. Um, so that, you know, if any of you are interested in working, working for the police, you might want to. I did, uh, I did, um my stigma reduction and then I tacked on the um, autism talk at the end for the Met Police 2019 I did that 
Um, and yeah, once everybody had left because they all had things to do and stuff like that, it was just us Autis left. And there was this lovely autistic uh, Met Police personnel. Um, I don't know what actual role they had, um, but yeah, th yes, yeah, so I don't know that we we can do the jobs that we know we can do. I think it we would be nice to be able to get to that point. No, exa exactly. Um... No, ex exactly. I think there's. I think there's going to be a lot of autistic people in the police force. I've, I've actually just taken on a because of my work on the independent advisory group. I've I've just taken on a. It's it's a public appointment. I've just joined. I've just joined the board of the Scottish Police Authority, which is incredibly exciting, really daunting. But do you know what I'm really chuffed about is that they've actually paid attention and they've gone. Oh maybe we need to include autistic people in terms of our, you know, because they're actually on a, on a drive to improve their kind of own diversity and include, inclusive and equality kind of practices within the police force. So I'm, I'm just incredibly chuffed. Sorry, I know I'm going off topic here, but it's oh, no, Well, it's not really. I mean, and the thing is, you'll probably find that there'll be lots of, they're, they're already there. They're just, they, oh, they don't know it or they're not they disclosed. Yeah. Um, it was... So size said it's Vice Admiral Nick Hine, who's been, yeah, quite open. Oh, that rings bells. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, okay, right. So uh moving on. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, there's too many. Okay, there's uh let's have a look. I know, and I'm sorry, I whiffle quite a great length for every question. No, no, I and I'm the same way, and we go off on tangents. It's just it's just the way of autistic communication. Um mm -hmm. Katrina and Swan have been a lifeline. Oh, so this is just a nice comment. So oh. have been a lifeline for our family and so many others in Scotland and further afield. Don't know what we would have done without Katrina and her support over the years. She's amazing. So that's a nice, nice that's, And I know who that is as well. So, um, so uh, I, I just don't say it um, out loud because it's on the recording, obviously. So. Sure, sure for different people um yeah, thank you so much for doing this great work and sharing with us i'm an autistic trans masculine person in the us working on my master's in occupational therapy they're interested in helping other autistic people and thinking of potentially leading support groups and life skills groups for autistic people do you have any advice on setting up and leading groups by and for autistics uh, he they pronouns so i guess the main question is just advice, I guess, about the kinds of groups that you run, um, how how you went about it, or well, it it really evolved quite slowly. So I started off wanting to do the whole let's change the world, let's educate everyone, let's kind of you know, and and we did start off doing that. We started off um, there was six of us um, used to meet at Strathclyde University once a month, and quite early on we produced a couple of leaflets and those leaflets were, were actually taken from minutes of our meetings and the first one was um, a guide to health professionals when working with autistic women so so we so we did do some quite kind of like concrete outcomes based you know kind of stuff but actually over a period of some time it just worked it just it just kind of emerged that really basically autistic people were getting in touch with us because they wanted to meet other autistic women and that, that actually there was an incredible power in that so it was actually a couple of the, that group it wasn't me who said we'd quite like to start a meetup group so a lot of you know our, a lot of our peer support actually has evolved out of that i would say it's really important it's, it, as I was saying earlier, it's really important to understand the underpinnings of what it is you're trying to do, to have a clear idea about the kind of group that you want to support and, 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 to, and to allow it to evolve fairly organically. Um, I have been told that I'm a dangerous person to talk to because I have to say I've always been really opportunistic, opportunistic you know, if people get in touch that I think have huge potential, I just go, right, you're, you're going to come and do stuff for us. But it takes time. Setting up a, a, a group really does take time and it will demand a lot of your patience and uh, it'll just demand everything you've got to get in touch. <laughs> so my advice is, be warned, be prepared, <laughs> um, look after yourself, um, make sure you have a support network, you know, make sure Actually, you... Yeah, I think that's probably one of the key ones is yeah. don't do it by yourself. No, don't do it by yourself. Make sure no. you... Yeah, I mean, I I started off by because I met... The... <laughs> I met the woman who has been tasked with helping to roll out the new, then new 10-year 10, 10 Scottish autism strat strategy um, 
Ian and Wendy Dunlop at Strathclyde University and I said I think we need a women's network she went what a good idea um and she she kind of gave me a ready-made group of six autistic women or five autistic women who were already kind of known to her um but I was really lucky in that lens particularly just became such a fantastic support for me you know she's an autistic woman herself um but she's she's really grounded and she's always the voice of reason and she's really thoughtful and she just was so that yeah I wouldn't have swum with it five so her and having those people to bounce those ideas around as well so I miss Annette because Annette's still trying to finish her, her thesis and so I haven't had her around for about a year really yeah. Yeah. Um, but she she is the person that I do a lot of my support programs with and things like that. So having I think having somebody or multiple somebodies, because that said that person says um, interested in helping other autistic people thinking of potentially leading support groups. Right. There's no real mention of other people. And I think I think actually that's you, you need uh, one of the things we try to do for each of our meetup groups is we do try to get at, at least two facilitators to each group because you yep. really need that backup. Um, the other thing is uh, just to re-emphasize what is it you actually want to do? If it's a support group, then think about what do you what skills do you need to do that? And you know? safeguarding. We've always yeah, we always consider safeguarding for or just even basic rules. So basic oh. rules for engagement, safeguarding, yeah. what will you do if someone comes to the group that is either really dominating or domineering or has serious mental health problems or is, you know, so, um, I mean, having said that, you know, I just launched into this without really thinking about it, but I do have previous training and skills to call on. Um, that is the thing, you know, it's not like I've done, I've done community work training, I've done, I've done group work training, I've, I've worked as a lecturer and a, men, and a student mentor, so I have previous skills to call on, so, and if you don't already have those, then think about how you might acquire some of them, or find other people who do have them. They're doing their masters in occupational therapy, so I think there'll be some good skills they can take from that. Yeah. Um, and I definitely, yeah, and size so putting um, safeguarding and mediation, I think, and, and also how to manage the different communication in yep. those spaces spaces sorry because like you say Annette and I always work together so even though she's quite busy at the moment we still run our social group on a Tuesday together um we'll do breakout rooms if the room gets too big because yep. about 20 people turn up yep. online obviously at the moment yep. um but we would have things like um well one of us tries to man the chat box for the ones that are situationally mute in the group you know it's it does take a lot of your energy and spoons so yeah. i think having somebody to rely on to do that with you is a good idea Absolutely. Okay, we've got kind of two main questions and then um we'll try and be done so um the next one was do you know of any similar programs in the us to what you discussed um i don't um but we have like i say we have had people from the us join us and from canada um Dena, Gla Dena Glasner is an advocate in the US that I know of um I mean I yeah I, no the short answer is actually no I don't sorry um I know there are individual advocates in 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 the US and and in Canada but I don't know that that specific kind of program for employment support. and given and um, yeah and given that really there isn't that much in the UK either because you're doing it yourself kind of thing um I know that there's other there's like a, the large organization like Genius Within tries to do that kind yeah, of work they're really interesting aren't they um and things like that so oh and that person saying they're in Canada um okay. so yeah it might be do you need to make it yourself because usually that's my been my go-to does the thing exist if it doesn't exist then I need to make it and then that's finding other people like I say, I think our main message is to find the other people to work with to build these things. Yep. It's it's not it's not healthy to be an island for multiple reasons. Um, but part of that is also we're not the only autistic in the village. You need the other perspectives of different people as well, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do any bodies exist as like, I, I guess, organisations or bodies, do any bodies exist to help with disclosure of autistic identity in the workplace or perhaps help with mishandling sensitive inf information like a diagnosis? Well, then that's uh, plugging your webinar, potentially. 
It is, yes. <laughs> and do, our service, yes. Do any bodies exist to help with that disclosure of identity in the workplace or help with the mishandling of sensitive information like a diagnosis? Do we know of any? Um, oh, God. Well, I suppose theoretically any any of the um, organised... Well, your union actually should be able to help with that. Whether they are informed enough to be able to would be another question. Because, you know, if, if, if you have had sensitive information um, mis mishandled within the workplace, that is a problem. That's not just about autism. You, you know, that shouldn't be happening. Um, so I would I would potentially speak to your union, but be aware that your union may go. What do you what you're talking about? Um, so you know, you, um, yeah. I mean, that is the kind of thing that we would tackle. But obviously, we're we're a small organisation with yeah. no, like funding in Scotland. So um, um, yeah. But do keep an eye on, do keep an eye on the webinars because we are doing one specifically about disclosure. About disclosure, I think. Yeah. I mean, in terms of like what you say. If you are part of a union already, which, to be honest, if you are in, in employment, it is a good idea. Um, I do know of a couple of autistic people that I've kind of, it was almost like I was helping support give the information about the autistic need for their union rep to be informed, because yeah. the union reps are there for you. So they're on your side. If they're not knowledgeable, that's not necessarily a problem because they're not, it's not like they're trying, they're not going to be, um, you know, they're on your side. So they're there to, to support and fight for your right to employment yeah. um, or whatever the issue is. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's probably a good idea. And then just finding um, if there's somebody willing to support, educate that union rep so that they can appropriately. Um, so I've done that. I did that um, actually used, um, I don't know if it was Scottish autism, but it was Scottish something ADHD information for the workplace was very, very useful. Ooh, um, yeah. I, used, I used that okay. to um, explain why the, the, um, the employment environment wasn't suited to this um, person who had attention differences um, and basically what they were trying to discipline or and or fire them for were attention differences that hadn't been accommodated, even though he'd stated quite clearly from the beginning I have ADHD, yeah. um, you know, they hadn't put in place any real accommodations for him. So, so yeah, it can, can work. Yeah. And, and also look at your disability organisations. I mean, I, I, you know, I think we have a, we have a lot of, we have a lot to gain from working with a disability. I, I mean, I've, I've realised over a period of years that actually the autistic community is not always kind of really tuned into the disability community, but actually we do have a lot, I think, to gain from building those relationships. Because, because uh, you know, I'm more and more kind of like interested in the U United Nations definition of, of autism um, and, and, align, and aligning myself personally with, with that kind of definition of, of autism as a disability. Um, and, and even if personally I go, I, I'm not disabled, I'm, <laughs> I'm just autistic. Um, it, you know, in terms of making progress and, and, and make creating social change, um, aligning ourselves with the disability rights, movement is not a bad thing because to a great extent I do actually think that's where we are as a as yeah a and and certainly because I do I'm fully on board with the social model of disability I'm, I'm with you in that sense as well I am not inherently impaired by being autistic but I'm certainly disabled by being on an autistic person in the environments that I go into that you know they disable me those environments are not suited for me yeah, and I think I, absolutely, and but I also think I've come to that, and it's only very recently that I've I've kind of come to terms with this one, which is I think looking back on my life, I think there are things about being autistic that have caused me difficulties that are really not to do with society; they really are to do with me, me being autistic. And I would say the big one is understanding that discrepancy between my intellectual ability, which was huge. I'm not saying that I'm just doing being autistically honest and um, compared to my emotional maturity, which was way behind my peers. And, you know, my inability to access what I actually what I was feeling 
you know, I couldn't, I didn't, you know, I think it took me, it was something, I was in my early 30s when something happened that actually I started crying and I, I literally cried every day for months because I was catching up on all these years of not crying because I wasn't able to really access that, whatever the emotional thing was that I was experiencing in response. And you're right, Chloe, it would be in response to my bewilderment of being an autistic person in a non-autistic world. But the reality is it was still having an emotional impact on me that I couldn't access, I couldn't name, I couldn't, I couldn't you know. I'm sorry, is that a major, major ramble, but... Um, no, no, and I think well, sticking with the idea of of being clear, like I say, with the um, with the United Nations understanding that we're um, sorry, two seconds. I'm just going to tell him to answer the door. Okay. <laughs> oh, the joys. Okay, so just I'll fill in the gap. So what I'm trying to say is, I don't think autism in itself is um, necessarily always a disability and mostly we are disabled by being autistic people in a non-autistic kind of context but I, I do think I personally identify as having certain levels of impairment in, in terms of my, my functioning as I, as, I, as I matured and um, or, I don't know it's just difference isn't it it really is difference we, 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 we develop in different ways um, I'm really hoping Chloe is going to come back soon so I can stop <laughs> I can stop whiffling at a blank screen. Hooray, there you are. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I was trying very hard to fill in the gap and very conscious that it's half nine on a yes, on yes. Saturday night and yeah, I'm yes, now yes. really seriously whiffling. No, 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 that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll start to wrap up. Um, I think my, our, all the point I, I think you were making in that I think is quite a useful one is yes to as much as you might not personally as an individual consider yourself to be disabled in the UK at least we are classed as disabled when we are autistic and um, I think actually that's quite important because you know it's not the same because I'm not talking about employment but when I did an EHCP or I was attended an EHCP meeting so um, oh, I was running downstairs um, an education health care plan that's okay. right yeah for um basically pupils in the UK so you know you sit down with the teachers etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think the difficulty they kept you know referring to the child being autistic and the needs that they had and they really didn't understand how the environment needed to also change yeah and I think if we started to yeah. use the word disabled more often so people yeah. really understand that you can't change. So basically some of the, um, yep. the outcomes that they were proposing or the things that they were proposing were about changing that autistic child, which you really, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of things you can't do. Yep. Um, and if you'd actually phrased it as we're talking about a disabled child. Yep. So I'm thinking actually that's probably a better way to go. I think that's where we we it's well worth our while thinking seriously about you know all those all those battles that you know the, the campaigning that the disability rights campaigns had to had to go through in the kind of seventies and eighties, which again I, I remember quite quite well because you know back in my day we did not have wheelchair ramps you know we did not have those accommodations the disabled community actually had to come together. And, and battle for them and make the case. And I, I do think actually being able to parallel and to go, well, look, you know, if it's someone in a wheelchair, you would understand that you need escalators or you need wheelchair ramps. What we're asking for is something very similar, you know, in the school environment, for example, you know, autistic children really are damaged because of all these things, what you need to do is put in the wheelchair ramps for those children in order and to- And a lot of the so-called things that they were proposing or the things that they wanted as outcomes for this child mm. was effectively, they might as well have been saying, well, by the end of it, we want we want to be able to take your wheelchair away and you can walk. That's yeah. basically what it, it, it boiled down to. Uh, sorry about <laughs> It's absolutely right. Um, I did a presentation today, um, which is more focused on autistic girls specifically, and and you know, um, 
And, you know, that's what I say, you know, someone was telling me about their daughter who, you know, once a week was taken out of a particular class. They were taken out of their class to go and do social skills training. And I was going, I'm sorry, what is that about? You know, instead of targeting them, singling them out even more, taking them off to do training in how to not be autistic, why don't you once a week take the entire class through a, pro, a, a class about inclusion and tolerance and acceptance of difference and yeah. disability and all those things because a, every, everyone gains from it. You we know. had a whole live, uh, it, that was Kieran Rose, Jody is it, um, Tigger, Bobby Elman and myself and we talked about the issues with social skills training yeah. um, and social stories and what came out here here is we are looking sorry I'm trying not to swear here oh yeah um, and basically we um, what came out of that is um, because we had Rachel Cullen who's um, autistic master's student and, and did linguistics and she's come up with an amazing hypothesis about how we um, we do have pragmatic language ability but it's an autistic pragmatics and she's put out this whole hypothesis it's very very interesting and so in the works hopefully it will be a equal social stories if you like mm -hmm. but for both parties yeah, yeah, in the situation yeah. Yeah. not just the autistic one yeah, exactly um Brilliant. Brilliant. And, but that's, and yeah that's what ended up happening as well the the person one of the uh, the I think they were the inclusion inclusion lead, which was very distressing, was really angry when we were basically saying, why are we focusing on her communication? Why aren't you focusing as well on teaching the students around her to communicate with her? And he was so angry that I wanted to change the world. He said, are you really expecting us to change the world? I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, I, I would feel really bad if I didn't say this person's last one because. Um, OK. Uh, okay, so yeah, last one actually, because I'm about to go. And I about to, to, yeah. About, oh no. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely, the last one. Then um, my experience, and it is the last. Uh, my experience of the world of work that, sorry, my experience of the world of work that your continued employment is predicated upon what you can't do, rather than what you can do, no matter how well you do that thing. Um, how do you deal with this in Swan in situations where someone is about to lose their job? Does that make sense? In my experience of the world of work, continued employment is predicated on what you can't do. So they focus, okay, so the issue with employers focusing on, on well, you can't do that thing as yeah. opposed to what you can yeah. do. Um, well, I, I, I'm not sure I can say what's, what, we, what we do in SWAN because, you know, it, it's really kind of case dependent, obviously. Um, I think my, I would say my own experiences are, I, I, I get I get that and it's, it's amazing how often you feel that that's what's being focused on is the bit that you didn't get. So, for example, back in the day, I worked in the film and TV business and I was incredibly diligent. I was a really hard worker. I was really fast. I was intelligent and, you know, all applied myself. And I, 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 I mostly didn't take lunch breaks. I would go in, I'd do my job, I would get through it. I'd work really speedily, I'd get to the end. But, you know, sometimes I would get in a bit late because of executive functioning issues and I didn't understand why people were sitting around chatting and I didn't understand why they were sitting there till eight o'clock at night not actually doing anything. So I would just go, right, I'm done. So I'd go. And, and that's what got focused on. And I, and I remember thinking, but that's so unfair because actually I'm working harder than most of the people that you think are OK, but I'm not full. full, full. So I get I get it. Um, but in terms of your specific situation, it's really, really hard to comment on. Um, if someone's about to lose their job, yeah, we, we have taken the employment project, we have taken on people who are very close to losing their jobs. And like, like I said in my presentation, you know, we, 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 we've helped support people through grievance procedures and, you know, right back, you know, access to work stuff and all the rest of it. There is a limit to what we can do, though. Um, I have, have to say, we're not, we're not, we're not getting funded to take help people take their employers to court, for example, much as it would be wonderful to be able to do that. But you know, we've had to, we've had to draw up some boundaries because we, we, you know, we are being, we are being funded to go in and and, and help train employers and and support autistic people in the workplace. 
Um, so I, I can't give you an easy answer to that. I, I feel your pain uh, genuinely. Um, what I would say again is it goes back to if people are behaving like that towards you, then they're actually not, they're not acting. That's not good employment practice. And I think that's also something that's really important to remember that sometimes our experiences are not always down to the fact that we're autistic. Sometimes we're dealing with people who just aren't very good at their job. Just a bad, yeah, a bad, just bad um, employers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we try to focus on something positive um, yeah. at the end because yes, sometimes our true. conversations get quite serious. Yeah. Um, so usually we will ask, what is your favourite stim? Oh, what's my favourite stim? Well, I, I really love music. Um, so I think probably my favourite stim would be playing yet again for the five zillionth time, one of my favorite music videos and singing along and probably dancing, you know, and it will be one that I have watched over and over. And I might well do it six, 10 times when I need to, I go, oh my God, I really need heart performing Stairway to Heaven in front of Led Zeppelin so that I can just be happy. That's my favourite stim. Lovely. It's nice. Um, I don't know why size asks, let's see the new stimmy Chloe. I'm not any <laughs> different really, but um, like I say, I've got my new <laughs> lovely little guy here. But yes, lovely. Thank you everybody so, so much um, for joining us today. Um, next week we have, what do we have next week? I need to remember what I have next week. <laughs> I think next week is Harry Cromar, a lovely young autistic advocate, teenage autistic. Um, going to, we did a pre-record, but we will be. I can answer like questions and things to people. Um, he talks about the roots of the autistic mind, which is really interesting. It was this sort of way that he came up with as a young uh, autistic person because counselling and therapy doesn't really work for everybody who's autistic and it was a way for him to kind of pick apart the things that he was struggling with so and he's really fascinating um and his insights into his own mind if I remember rightly I think he's 14 or 15 I might have um uh, aged or <laughs> uh, aged him potentially um but yes lovely thank you ever so much everybody um on academy and we will see you next week <laughs>